on. It's live now. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we got a special day today. We got some a good new guest that we know all about, Mike Caney. We got Paul Offers going to talk about some of his really cool new stuff. Um, and of course, we got the the guy behind the dark screen, Denny. And so, welcome, happy New Year, everybody, and. This is going to be a great year. Paul, looking forward to, to knowing more about your workbench. Okay. Tim, the, Tim, the black screen is the only way I can get the clock to work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew I missed something today, that clock. Denny, you have to put that <laughs> clock on this side of the black screen. <laughs> okay. Shall I go for it? Go for it. Let's uh, just share this then. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen share. Yeah, uh, Paul, uh, yep. lock on your own screen. Your your YouTube is not showing. Lock your screen. Lock your camera onto your own screen. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about the latest situation with Workbench. Um, so Workbench, really, we've we've decided that we wanted to uh, focus on a particular subject. Workbench is a framework that allows you to uh, integrate tools, data, and workflow all within a single package. And it, it's got many, many applications, and we've looked at all sorts of possibilities within the IT industry and, and outside. But we decided that we wanted to lock, uh, lock ourselves into one particular development area initially so that we could deliver some really good uh, capability and then we'll move on to other areas in IT and in fact other areas uh, perhaps in other industries. So of course one of the great things we all know and love is Wireshark. Um, we use Wireshark extensively and we also use a lot of other network-based tools. So we decided that uh, in this feature set of um, Workbench we would focus on network engineering. So Wireshark, uh, Tim knows these numbers, many, many downloads per month. There's estimated to be one and a half million users. I'm, I'm a bit, I'm not sure about that. I think it might be a bit lower than that, but uh, anyway, there are a lot of users out there. Um, now, three years ago, uh, we calculated there was 370 million downloads. Uh, so that was back like three or four years ago. Yeah. Okay. Good. That's that sounds promising. Okay. So uh, obviously widely used by network and security engineers. Um, one of the things is that few of us, and I include myself in this, make full use of Wireshark. I watch a video by Laura Chapel, and I realise that I'm using about ten percent of what Wireshark's capable of. So I think we can all learn. Um, and this is one of the things that we wanted to include in Workbench is the ability to sort of push the boundaries with Wireshark. So um, if we look at IT performance and stability problems, we know that they can take weeks, months or years to fix and certainly Advanced 7 has looked at many long running problems. But what we've also found is that using tools like Wireshark, um, we're able to diagnose problems in days, if not hours, quite honestly. So it's been a great benefit to um, our business. Um, and of course, the other areas, um, cybersecurity, you know, every minute counts. You need to find out what's uh, caused the security breach. You may have to do some analysis very quickly. And you, there's going to be a lot of pressure on you uh, to be able to use Wireshark effectively. Now, the thing is that Obviously, a big benefit would be if we could get some expert guidance and we can watch YouTube videos and watch um, all the good and the great um, analyzing problems. But the trouble is that the scenario that I face, that Mike faces, that many other people face is not going to be exactly the same as that one on that video. But if we could um, model the workflows of some expert people, then we stand a chance of being able to uh, follow their workflows and um, successfully diagnose problems with tools like Wireshark. So 
we can model some of these people, but we could also have workflows that come from suppliers. Um, so if we're looking at a particular problem with an F5 load balancer, maybe we could have a specific workflow for that purpose. And also we could have workloads contributed by a community. Sort of brings us neatly to Workbench and Workbench is this ability to integrate data and tools with expert workflow. So as promised, I'm going to um, take my life in my hands and uh, debug a problem live on air, which um, should be good. So um, I've already uh, skipped a few sets in, uh, steps in my workflow. So let's open up the workflow. Um, I have set up the uh, data on the left hand side in this object explorer here. Um, so uh, we can get working quite quickly. So on the right hand side here, you see that we have some instructions and this is the uh, workflow and we'll see how the workflow adapts as you work. So I hope this is this um, is coming through quite clearly and not too small. Is that okay, guys? Does it look okay? Yeah, it looks it's a little small. A little small. Okay, I'll, I'll zoom in if I get the opportunity to uh, in any particular area. So uh, one of the things I can see is for you guys, close that behind, the uh, icons at the bottom, the Hangouts things are covering over the, uh, the bottom of the workflow. So let's move that up. Okay. So here we see that um, the first flow thing the workflow is asking us for is the name of the user that had the, the problem. And um, his name was Mark. Uh, so we can enter that information. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry about that. My eagerness. Um, we have to enter application information. What application was he using? He was using this application called Contoto. Um, now, I hope that you can see here that the workflow's already started to adapt. You can see that it's already recognized the fact that Mark was the user. And um, we'll see later that it understands that the application was this application called Contoso. So let's put some information in. So what was his perceived response time? It was 30 seconds. And uh, what is an acceptable response time for this application? Two seconds. And so then what's the difference? Unfortunately, the workflow at the moment can't do the time maths. Uh, math. It will be able to soon, but uh, right now it can't. So we have to put that in. 28 seconds of excessive response time. Um, and now you see a very typical thing. You can see that it's uh, recognizing that it's Mark accessing an application called Contoso. So how did he access it? He accessed it using a PC and uh, the IP address was 192.168.10.81. We enter that information. Have you added the trace data? Yes, I have. Uh, wants to know the client file set, which is this file set over here. So I'll simply copy that and paste that into here. You can see it's a fairly straightforward, you know, you just have to follow a few fairly simple instructions. Did you capture traces near the server? Well, actually I did, because I've got these ones here, these web ones, but I'm gonna, gonna say no here, just for the purposes of this uh, exercise. And I'll show you one where I, I answered yes to that question. Um, did Mark, you or anyone else send markers at the time of the problem? Yes, we did. So now might be a good point to show you the problem. Now, I can drag a video of the problem onto this work pad. I can grab media player and simply fire it up. And I happen to know that the problem happened at about two minutes. So let's go further in. Um, this is probably not going to show terrifically well, but you can actually see that the application is already hung. You see at the top, it says waiting for Web01. Um, it's hung at this point and uh, eventually it times out. I think it's after about 30 seconds 
And then we'll see over here in this left screen um, where Mark sent a marker. So you can clearly see the mark has been sent there and it's marker number seven um, is the, uh, this one just here. So that's useful. So we've got a marker in the um, a network trace that shows exactly what time the problem occurred. So let's crack on. It says we've got to uh, drag the data onto the work pad. So we've done that. And uh, now we're going to drag the marker finder tool onto here. And the marker finder tool is going to skim through all of the trace files in that set. In fact, in this one, I think there's only one. Yeah, there's only one. And you can see it's found marker number seven here in the, uh, in the output. Now you could have 200 files here and it would skim the whole lot and find the marker quite quickly. And I can launch directly to a point in the trace where that marker exists. So that's one thing I can do. And you can see there's the marker just there. Um, so I've done the marker finder. Was the marker sent immediately before the problem? No, it wasn't. Was it sent immediately after the problem? Yes, it was. What's the marker ID? PJO M equals seven. So here we're just recording the information and you'll see how the information is used in later instructions. But eventually what will happen is some of these steps will be automated. So when it says, uh, did you find the marker? You'll just enter the marker name or you'll click over here in the marker grid and it will pre-populate the information in the, uh, in the workflow. While I'm gabbling on here, does anybody, do you have any questions, you guys? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, if someone wanted to go back and uh, kind of review this, did, you, you said you were going to put a video up on this, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, we're, caught, we're videoing this, se this session, so this will be up on the uh, Love My Tool um, site. Um, there are a number of tutorial videos on the Tribe Lab site, um, and uh, we basically give a step by step of how to do this. The workflows that we're introducing are gradually evolving. This is the third workflow we've written. The first two we wrote, the first one is modeled on um, a video that Laura produced okay. um, looking at uh, website performance issues, and the second one was. Um, modeled on our friend Chris Greer's workflow, um, something that he used when he did his Sharkfest session on uh, TCP tips and tricks. And okay. what we did was we took the basis of what he did and then tried to model it. Um, and it works really well. We've tried it on a few um, sample traces and it seems to work well. So we have a few um, workflows up there already. Um, I do notice we've got quite a few viewers, actually. Um, if you are watching this and you want to drop a question to me, if you look over on the left-hand side of your um, Hangout screen, if you move your mouse over there, you'll get a toolbar that will pop out and you'll see a chat box. And if you uh, open that up, you can enter, um, chat in, enter the chat um, group on the right-hand side and by all means, um, drop, me a, drop me a note. That'd be good. So let's carry on. So record the time of the problem. Because this uh, timestamp here is rounded to the nearest second, so I needed to allow for that. So we can put in there 15, 40, 32. That's the end time of the problem. But the start of the problem is the response seconds, and then we're going to allow an additional 20 seconds for errors in estimating the response time. So 15, 39, uh, 42 is the number. So we enter that. Close the marker finder tool. OK, that's done. And uh, now we get into the, the real business. So we grab uh, this filter tool here. And what we're going to do is we're going to specify a filter expression 
of IP of the IP address. You can have any Wireshark type filter expression in here. A bit. Uh, we should change the time range. So 15, 39, 42. Oops. To 15, 40, 32. In a future release, we're going to allow you to actually enter the numbers at the end of the time range to make this slightly easier. Um, Okay, and I want to in sync uh, sins. I want merged output file. In fact, yeah, that's uh, okay. Don't click the filter button button yet. It says okay. I won't. So we've completed that, and now we need to put in a, a name for the file. I'm going to put in this name. But we're going to change the colons because that's not acceptable in uh, DOS, uh, Windows, DOS. <laughs> you know what I mean. Um, and we need to enter the name into our workflow. So we've got a record of it. So we do that. And now we can fit, press the filter button. So that, now that's just filtered based on the criteria that I specified. and. It's opened it in um, what by Shark on actually. Um, okay, so we've done that. So you can see over here, we've got quite a lot of information in here, and you can see it's gradually becoming more, more and more uh, rich with uh, the context of the problem. In that now we've got start and end times for the problem. We've got IP addresses, we've got names of files, we've got all sorts of things in there. Okay. Uh, in Object Explorer, create a trace set with this name. I'm going to click create that. That's done. And uh, then it's going to ask me to go and find the filtered trace that I just created. So I need to add a file. Uh, it's not in that lot. Oops. Okay, that's done. Uh, press Control S to save the workspace. That's just because I've made changes to the Explorer, so it's best if I save it before everything goes wrong. Um, is Control S universal, Paul? Yeah, Control S. That's right. Always, always hit Control S. Close the filter tool. That's done. Okay. Clear the work pad. That's done. We're going to uh, this the workflow. Um, we're going to make some quite fancy changes to this, and also improve, improve the speed of it. Um, it's doing quite a lot in the background, but we figured out a way to make it go faster. So, okay, drag the file that I just created that one onto the work pad. Done that, and uh, that means I'm ready to go now. That's all the prep work done. So now I've filtered it. So you can imagine I could have started off with, say, 100 filter files, uh, 250 meg each, and I've now got a single filter file of a lot less that's got the problem somewhere in it. Um, so that um, simplifies, uh, you know, the analysis. So we drag and drop Wireshark. I want to reveal this a bit further. So I'm going to drag that onto there. Okay, so done that. Now it says I should go to X endpoints so that I can find out which ports we're talking to in this application. So statistics, endpoints. Now the ones I'm interested in are these two, 445 and 80. They're the two I'm actually interested in because uh, these ones are all the ports for my own 
uh, for Mark's PC. So they're all dynamic ports. So let's go back to the workflow. Done that. And it basically says I should uh, save the TCP service ports here. And it says don't bother saving 445, so I won't. So it's just port number 80 I have to worry about. And then it's asking me for the UDP ports. So when there are none in this trace clip, so I put none in there. Uh, close the endpoint dialog box. Okay, done that. Go to edit preferences. I hope I'm not going too fast for this. I, I, I thought that it would be boring if I went slowly and you can always stop the video later on review and see what I did. Um, so I just realized that's not enough. Okay. Uh, I've already got port 80 specified in there, so that's okay. I can leave that. So that's done. Oh, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. I just know what it's going to ask me to do. Port 80, yeah, I've already got that, so I can skip that. Uh, no UDP ports, so I don't have to do that. Um, save the settings, I've already done that. In the bottom right hand corner of Wireshark, choose my transom profile. This is something in the earlier instructions, it tells you to set this up. So um, that's the transom profile set up. So that's done. So if you're not familiar with transom, um, it uh, does some performance analysis on individual request response pairs. Um, so you can see that we now have some additional columns here. Um, with uh, response time information, service information, and the basically the time on the network, request spread and response spread. It's just a, a plugin that you can get. We, that will be in future releases of Wireshark, actually. We submitted it to the project, and uh, it's actually in the current dev builds. So if you're keen to use it from That's there. Awful. Or you can, um, you can download the plugin from the TribeLab site, actually. So, transom, we put in that filter term. So we've done that. And you'll see quite quickly now, we're gonna to come to the uh, interesting bit. Click on the APD response time at the column header twice. Okay, once, twice, and then go to the top. Done it. And it now says, is the slowest APDU response time equivalent to greater than 30% of the slow response time of 30 seconds, which was the user's response time? And lo and behold, oh, yes, it is. So there's one of 29 seconds. We know it's for this user because it's for his uh, from his IP address, and we know it's within the time window of his problem. So let's carry on. Number 39. Um, so, yes, it is. And uh, frame number's 39. Enter the APDU response time here. So, quick way to do that is to click on 39 and just copy it from here and paste it into there Oops. 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 the um, time entry part of this What's the destination 192.168.378.1268.378 uh, Transport protocol is TCP. Okay, record the TCP information. Port number, I think, is 80. Uh, yeah. So it's asking me about that destination port number just there. So that's 80. Uh, 
APDU time is made up of service time and plus the spread values. Is the service time of frame 39 greater than 50% of 29.4850 seconds? And yes, it is. Okay, what is the service time? Uh, that will be in there. Okay. Um, this looks like a problem with the service. But it's possible that the packet loss that, that packet loss has inflated the service time. The traces we are analyzing have been captured on Mark's PC. If the packets from the service to Mark's PC were delayed or lost, then retrans or retransmitted, the overall additional delay would be attributed to service time. So then what it's going to go on to say is what we really need is traces to the other end. Um, but what it's doing is it's giving you a summary of the information gathered and advising you that you should go and talk to the owner of the Contozo application, in particular the service that's running on uh, the server 192.168.378 and uh, see if they can explain why there's an issue. So I don't know what happens next actually, what happens after that, probably just ends. Yeah, this is the end. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, that was a bit of a rush, but as you can see that I, I I managed to get through that in about 25 minutes now, except I've been using Workbench for quite a while now, but what we're hoping is that someone who's faced with a dilemma like this to analyze trace data, where it might take them, say, two days to get to grips with um, the analysis and they'll fall down lots of holes and make lots of mistakes. Really, this is like a jump start. This is to get someone in there fixing problems and actually determining the root causes um, very quickly. And, you know, that if I was doing that from scratch, that would take me at least a day to do what I've just done, and it's now taken me 25 minutes. And that's really what we're trying to do with the workflows. We're trying to... Um, enable people who are inexperienced uh, analysis of work uh, of Wireshark traces, help them to actually get, uh, get productive very quickly. And I'm going to show you one more thing. Let's imagine that I didn't have the traces at the web end of this, but I do have a log of the problem. Um, so this is a this is an IIS weblog off of the web server that was serving up the Contozo application. What I can do is I can take Wireshark, drag and drop it onto the log, and it reads the log um, is the first thing. And I can use filter the same sort of filter terms as I or search and filter terms as I would use with uh, a network trace. I'm going to put in the marker identifier. So you can see I've found the marker there. Um, I've got some additional fields in here. Uh, let's add in the one that's called time taken. So let's apply that as a column. And if I now, uh, sorry, find my marker again. If I, uh, if I back up a bit um, through this log, you can see that I've got 29 milliseconds there, uh, sorry, 29 seconds there, 26 seconds, 28 seconds. So you can see there's obviously some big problem in this area, and this is the problem that was affecting my user. Now, because that's in the web log, it's very difficult for the application people to say it's not an application or web infrastructure problem or could be a back-end database problem. It's certainly not a network problem, not a front-end network problem. So this is just another way of uh, enriching the information that we can get from network traces with um, supplementary information from, from other sources. Okay. I'm done. I'm done in. <laughs>
<laughs> that was a bit of a race. <laughs> You're done in, is what you mean, right? Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> when you when you when you started to create Workbench, what was your what was your motivation other than helping people? But what was your overall motivation technologically? Um, what was happening was that we have a, a course that we deliver called RPR Foundation Course, which teaches uh, people how to troubleshoot problems following a, a systematic approach. Uh, in that. Um, some of the practicals in that course involve trace analysis and they're very simple and everybody manages to do them but the question that kept arising and it's been arising for years now is this is great but how am I going to do this when I get back to the office um, and we wanted to provide a way to help people do this that was the starting point and then it grew a bit and you, you now see what, what you've got I mean ultimately what I'm trying to do and I've been trying to do this for years, is help people be effective at analysing diagnostic data. Um, I, I hope this is going to help. But that's all I can, all I can say. Um, we're, really, we're really keen on it, and we've got some great ideas uh, to add into this, but it's taken us a long time to get to this point. Um, well, but, Paul, yeah. every, tooth, every toolkit has more than one screwdriver. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the, be the beauty of this is that with Wireshark, uh, sorry, with Workbench, you can add whichever any tool you want into the toolbox, which means you can then go on to create any workflow for any tool that can be added into the toolbox. So I've got at the moment Wireshark, Excel, Procmon, Pro Perfmon, Media Player, Ultra Edit, and Microsoft Packet, uh, Microsoft Message Analyzer. I've had also in there um, Jasper's. Um, Trace Wrangler product, um, and we're going to do some work around that. He's been uh, sending us some information about that, so we want to do a tighter integration of that. So what you'll be able to do is, um, our intention is that you'll be able to, if you want to sanitize or anonymize a trace, you'll be able to drag and drop Trace Wrangler onto the trace, and it will immediately produce an anonymized version. Wow, that's um, great. Yeah, Paul, that's immediately yeah. right. When I first... Uh, when you first started doing the demo, the first thing I thought of is there are so many applications for this uh, beyond Wireshark. But I look at this from a, a Wireshark perspective, is, and as you know, I've taught many classes, a lot of uh, questions that people ask are, where do I start, right? And this is, uh, this is really cool because it's like having a Wireshark expert back at the office looking over your shoulder and saying, okay, now go here, now go here. And uh, I think it's fantastic. Thank you. That's good. I'm, I'm glad you, you like it. It's um, I think I think you're right. And what we'd like to do is um, at the moment, the workflows are defined in a really clunky manner. We've got a, a very basic tool that enables us to define the workflows. But what we're going to do is def develop a quite sophisticated tool and then open it up to the community. So the community will be able to define workflows. So, um, and I could see how you might define a workflow for your, um, for one of your courses, for example, define the workflow and then, uh, you know, you can run them through practicals and they use the workflow. Yeah, it'd be great for labs, right? Uh, uh, yeah, that. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, this, is, uh, this is awful, awesome, and I'm going to make sure, I, I'm, it's so Good, I'm going to download it, okay? Is that okay with you? No. <laughs> oh, well, that's good. That's scary. Okay, I know that's scary, Paul. Okay, so you know. Yeah. Be nice. Hey, hey, Tim, give me a call when you need help. Mike, yeah. you're, dating, you're in trouble. And the downloading piece, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, free uh, um, from the Tribe Lab site, the only thing you have to do is you have to register uh, to join the community. You can join the community, it's totally free. Um, the reason we want it, we're asking people to register is because obviously we want feedback. And uh, if you're registered, you can use the um, bug uh, and help forums and the uh, feedback forums. So um, we're very keen to get uh, some input into this. Um, the downloads uh, started very fast and then slowed up a bit. And now they've just started to pick up again. So it's quite interesting watching what goes on. And I'm, I, I can't imagine, I haven't figured out what's driving the demand. 
Um, I'm going to try and figure that out, but uh, we're getting quite a level of fluctuation in the, in the frequency of downloads. I think that's because there's a frequency of need. Yeah. You know, one day I don't need it, I'm doing updates or I'm fighting other fires, but now today I got a problem I've got to analyze. So, uh oh, I got to go get workbench. Uh, sure. And then as it begins to spread, I know that I was talking to the university here that I go out and harass students periodically, and uh, uh, they, they're going to add that to one of their curriculum. So, uh, you know, it'll come in burst, uh, same way as Wireshark. Wireshark has the same thing. Sure. Yeah, sure. And and obviously, the, you. I mean, what we're hoping for is the, the hockey stick, you know, um, that mm -hmm. uh, there'll be some tipping point, and then um, it will become very popular. I think they'll become very popular. I mean, Mike, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. There, there's so much application for, uh, as you mentioned, you, you've created one for Excel. I could, I was sitting there thinking, man, I wish somebody would create one for some of the Adobe products because uh, <laughs> I'm not so yeah. great with it. But this is, <laughs> there's so many, so many uh, capabilities that you could leverage this for. I think it's a fantastic idea. It's a, who wouldn't want to have an expert looking over their shoulder? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, guys, and thanks for letting me show show this off. And uh, I, um, obviously, to to the people who are watching, um, please drop me an email or, or stick a comment on the um, Tribe Lab forums um, if you want to know more or if you have some suggestions about uh, improvements, etc. I'd love to or, hear from uh, you. Or there's actually um, there's actually a live chat app on the YouTube page. Okay. Uh, and and Ryan Anderson uh, just asked a question. So if you can't get to it, let me just read it for you. It says, um, "Is there?" I'm obviously, a, we're looking at the chat group. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you see it? Do you see it from Ryan? I can't. Could you tell me what he says? Yeah. Uh, so the first question is: Is there a workflow repo? The second question is. Uh, tutorial on creating our own custom workflows. Yeah, and then the last one he just said thanks. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, in answer to your questions, Ryan, um, yes, there will be the equivalent of a repo, um, and yes, we will provide tools um, to actually define workflows. So uh, there'll be a, a community repository of workflows. So. That'll be contributed by anybody who is prepared to share uh, their work, and certainly there'll be some Tribe Lab um, workflows in there. We also foresee there being some commercial workflows, um, probably very specific around um, uh, complex tasks or even support tasks. Um, so, some of the possibilities, you know, are things like, you know, how do you prepare for a call to a Cisco TAC? Um, now, you could have a workflow that says, okay, well, these are the things you need to do. And because of the adaptive nature, it can accommodate a lot more than just a static checklist. Um, you know, and it can adapt by product and adapt in all sorts of ways. So we could see lots of um, different possibilities for this. And uh, we will be providing tools for people to define their own workflows. We're hoping to make it very intuitive, very sort of uh, graphical, because the way we do it at the moment is truly clunky. <laughs> it's uh, So I wouldn't uh, open that up to anybody. It would be a real struggle for everyone, because I struggle to define them at the moment. But um, the guys, are, the, the developers are working on uh, working up ideas on how to uh, produce a graphical version. Now, one, one, one question I've seen is people always say, well, I can see my data here, I can get it locally. How do I get the data from another location so I can compare events? And our span is not the best way. Uh, that's kind of like wishing and dreaming that you get something relevant. Uh, sure. What kind of remote tools, are, are there any that you are going to try to integrate later down the road so they can grab it with T-Shark or something and send it back? Yeah, there are actually, that's a, good, that's a very good point. So one of the things that we've done in the Object Explorer is we've named um, the, a lot of the objects, you'll notice we've called them file sets and files. That was probably a mistake, and we're going to uh, 
probably change the language and uh, talk more about data sets and data, data objects. And uh, that opens up the possibility of having uh, a data object that is uh, a trace clip on, say, a NetShark or on a, um, you know, uh, uh, a Viavi box or whatever. Um, a lot of these boxes now are coming out with um, REST interfaces, so API type interfaces. And what we hope to do is um, hook into those so that rather than drag all the data back and run a, um, some sort of filter on the, on the desktop of the analyst, what will happen is it will run the filter on the uh, box and just pull the trace clip back. Um, so yeah, we, would, we definitely are interested in that. Um, what I hope to do is start to talk to some of the um, some of the suppliers, you know, the uh, you know people like NetScout and Viavi and uh, Riverbed, um, and our friends at Endace as well. Hey Tim, I, mean, I know. Hey Tim, you, Tim, I know how much you this. I know how much you dislike span ports and in particular <laughs> R span. I, we all know that, and so I'm going to give you a gift for the year of the rooster. Which is that our span? Our span? Our span is like pissing your own pants to keep your. It's like pissing your pants to keep yourself warm. That's <laughs> 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 so, a choice. And, and it's hard. And it's hard to believe that Denny likes me. <laughs> so I was going to say, Paul, would there be any integration of this to something like Easy Trace? <laughs> uh, I'm not familiar with Easy Trace actually. I'm really keen to integrate it with lots of things. I mean, we've been working on, we've been looking at how can we integrate it with uh, Riverbed Packet Analyzer and also with Splunk. Um, so well, that'd be good. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm keen to integrate with. Uh, you know, what we're going to do is because um, at the moment in the toolbox, if you put Splunk in there, you can drag and drop Splunk onto a file. Mm -hmm does the transformation of the data between uh, packet data and uh, say a CSV the problem is that Splunk hasn't got a way there's not you can't use a command line to inject that data into Splunk mm -hmm. so what we're going to do is we're going to create um, custom wrappers around certain applications um, we call these tools guest tools so there'll be uh, guest tool wrappers that will wrap around things like um, Packet Analyzer and Splunk and other other such tools such as Easy Trace, which I will look up when I come off this session. <laughs> okay, if you need, if you have any trouble finding it, now Paul, one time would you go ahead and tell everybody uh, the um, the Tribe Lab website? Just TribeLab.com. Simple as that. All right, TribeLab.com, gang, and there's a lot yeah. out there. Uh, there's Paul, a lot of you have there. done an incredible job. Yeah, we've just added a lot of information about SMB2 uh, analysis as well because, you know, everybody in the world uses a Windows account at some point in their life. Uh, that means they'll be using SMB2. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we've got some information, a lot of information on there about that now as well. Paul, you've done a heck of a job. I mean, even just with, you know, Transom, uh, adding this to the Wireshark community, this is a... Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing it from the wire, you know, the Wireshark community worth reaching out to you. Yeah. Um, and again, if you guys want to go out to Wireshark, it's Wireshark.org. There are a few fake sites out there. If it goes redirect, stop it. Not Wireshark. Uh, don't want to download malware uh, for free, or even for pay. But you definitely don't want to get it for free. Uh, Paul, this is great. You guys have done a heck of a job. In just case anybody didn't know, Paul is from Britain, uh, so he, that's why he says things nicer than we do. <laughs> yeah, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Paul, we should, we should probably close. It's, uh, it's 45 minutes. Yeah. Fine. So, Mike, you got anything to say? Or you, are you, you... Uh, no, oh, I, Paul. fantastic. Thanks, Paul. I was glad to see it. Okay. All right. Well, I will close the show then as I've got the uh, big red stop button. Um, so thanks very much for attending everybody who's been watching. And uh, also thanks to you guys for um, being the panel today. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bless all.